Sergeant Leonardo, please start your recording. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the, of the subcommittee on zoning and franchises. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video? Once again, if all panelists could please turn on their video. Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Moyer, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, good morning. I'm a uh, council member Francisco Moya, chair of the subcommittee on zoning and franchises. Uh, I am joined today uh, remotely uh, by council members Rivera, Gradenchik, uh, Levin, Lansman, and we are also joined by uh, members Ampri Samuel and uh, Jaeger. As a preliminary uh, point of information, I would like to note that uh, LU 658 for the 50 Old Fulton Street proposal is being laid over. Uh, today we will vote on a rezoning proposal for which the subcommittee held a public hearing on September 14th. And we will also hold public hearings on zoning proposals with a special permit application. Um, but before we begin, uh, I recognize the subcommittee council to review the remote uh, hearing procedures. I'd like to turn it over to our council. Thank you, Chair Moya. I am Arthur Ha, counsel to this subcommittee. Members of the public wishing to testify were asked to register for today's hearings. If you wish to testify and have not already registered, we ask that you please do so now by visiting the council's website at www.council.nyc.gov. Members of the public may view a live stream broadcast of this meeting at the New York City Council website. When called to testify, Individuals appearing before the subcommittee will remain muted until recognized by the chair to speak. Applicant panels will be recognized as a group and called first. Members of the public will be called and recognized one at a time. When the chair recognizes you, your microphone will be unmuted. Please take a moment to check your device and confirm that your microphone is on before you begin speaking. And I will remind all participants that there is some delay in the process of unmuting. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you have written testimony you would like to submit instead of appearing here before the subcommittee, you may email it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number and or project name in the subject line of your email. During the hearing, council members with questions should use the Zoom raise hand function the raise hand button should appear at the bottom of your participant panel. Council members with questions will be announced in order as they raise their hands, and Chair Moya will then recognize members to speak. Witnesses are reminded to remain in the meeting until they are dis uh, excused by the chair as council members may have questions. Finally, there will be pauses over the course of this meeting for various technical reasons, uh, and we ask that you please be patient as we work through uh, any issues. Chair Moya will now continue with today's agenda items. Excuse me, Chair Moya, you are uh, muted. My apologies. Thank you. Thank you for that, Arthur. Uh, I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by uh, Council Member Reynoso. Um, and with that, uh, today we will be voting to approve LUs uh, 678 and 679 for the uh, 5914 uh, 
Bay Parkway rezoning related to property in Council Member Yeager's district. The application seeks a rezoning map amendment to change an R5 district to an R6C24 district and a zoning text amendment to map a mandatory inclusionary housing area on the east side of Bay Parkway between 59th and 60th Street with uh, MIA option one, two, and the workforce option. The proposal would facilitate the development of a nine-story mixed-use building with ground floor retail, community facility use, and residential use. Council member, the council member uh, Yeager is in support of this project, and I now call for a vote to approve LUs 678 and 679. Uh, council, if you would please uh, call the roll. Chair Moya. How about I? Council member Levin. I vote aye. <clears throat> Council member Lanceman. Aye. Council member Reynoso. Mission to explain my vote. Mission um, granted. I just uh, want to say that what we're voting on with this application um, speaks to the issues we have with ULERP uh, and the need to change it significantly. Uh, while we were <clears throat> had members of the city council uh, thinking about voting for a project that was uh, prioritized by developers in Industry City, in this one case, uh, no one's talking about member deference when it comes to the building of unaffordable housing in parts of uh, in parts of the city where it's uh, greatly needed. We are in a housing crisis. It is a housing crisis especially members in black and brown districts that have bear the burden of having to build all the affordable housing, almost exclusively in those districts. Approving this application is saying that the affordable housing being built in your district exclusively is exactly the way we wanna to continue to do this work. Segregation um, in the city is something that we wanna to continue to do. And I can in good conscience vote for a project that is giving a one bedroom apartment for $2,500 and that that is considered affordable. This developer is getting a parking increase, $2,500 um, worth of rent. I don't know where, if any, there is a, a give back to the city for allowing this rezoning to happen. Um, so while I respect what members are doing in their own communities, in, this, in these cases, this is about the greater good. It isn't about an individual member. It isn't about an individual district. So because the workforce option is being used here, I'm going to have to vote no. Council member Gordenchik. Aye. Council member Rivera. Aye. Uh, currently, the vote stands at five in the affirmative, one in the negative, and no abstentions. The vote will remain open. Thank you, uh, Council. Um, I now uh, open the public hearing uh, on LU 682 through 685 for the 1510 uh, Broadway rezoning relating to property in Council Member Ambry Samuels District in Brooklyn. The application by the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development seeks approval of a set of related land use actions, including urban development action area project uh, designation and disposition approval, acquisition of a portion of the development site by the city, a zoning map amendment to change an R6C13 district to an R71C24 district, and a zoning text amendment to map a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing options one and two, uh, together, these actions would facilitate the construction of a new eight-story building with approximately 107 units of affordable housing and approximately 9,000 square feet of ground floor commercial space. Uh, I want to now uh, recognize uh, Council Member Amprey Samuels to offer uh, her remarks uh, on this project. Council Member. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Chair Moya, for the opportunity. Um, I've met with this developer um, and HPD on several occasions, and I am actually proud to be supportive of this development. It sits right there 
on the Broadway side of my district, which is the northern part of my district, where we're seeing a lot of development and changes in the community. And this will allow an opportunity for real affordable housing. And I also want to say that I appreciate the thoughtfulness in the design of the building and the materials used, and even the concept of eventually um, being able to work with MTA for a possible elevator because of the increase in um, the population size in that area and the need for an elevator period on that subway line. So um, I am in support. Um, there was a lot of community um, input and engagement and I look forward to updates if there are any during this presentation and I do have a few questions after. So thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Council, if you could please call the first panel uh, for this item. The applicant panel for this item will include Lynn Zhang, HPD, Rella Fogliano, appearing on behalf of the sponsor, McQuestin Companies, and Stacy Wong, principal uh, architect for the project. Also available for questions and answers as needed are Aaron Buchanan for HPD, and Joe Apicella, Ron Shulman, and Bill Wilkins for the development team. Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to speak. Uh, Council, if you could please administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all uh, council member questions? I do. Yes. I yes. do. Thank you. And uh, we are now in receipt of your slideshow presentation uh, for this proposal. Uh, when you're ready to present the slideshow, uh, it will be displayed on the screen. The presentation will be advanced uh, by the next slide when you say next. And please note that there might be a slight delay uh, as the presentation is loaded, as well as for the uh, advancing of slides. Uh, and finally, before we begin, uh, just please just state your name uh, and affirmation once again for the record, um, and you may begin. Thank you. Um, thank you, Arthur. Thank you, Council Member. My name is Lynn Zhang. I'm Director of Growth and Planning at the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Land use numbers 682 through 685 are related to proposed ULERP actions for a project known as 1510 Broadway in Brooklyn Council District 41. The project area includes one city-owned vacant lot located at Block 1489, Lot 11, and one privately owned lot um, on Lot 1. The ULERP actions before the City Council involve Urban Development Action Area Project, known as UDAP, designation, project approval, disposition of city-owned land, acquisition, approval, as well as a zoning map and zoning text amendments, establishing mandatory inclusionary housing area. More specifically, land use number 682 is related to zoning text amendment, amendment allowing for the establishment of an MIH area under options one and two. This will allow for the proposed construction of approximately 27 permanently <clears throat> affordable housing units under MIH option one. Land use number 683 seeks approval for the city to reacquire a portion of block 1489 lot 11, which will be reserved for the MTA to add a future ADA accessible elevator that's in connection to the adjacent Halsey Street subway station. Land use number 685 is related to the land use item seeking to amend the zoning map by amending the existing R6 with C13 commercial overlay, instead mapping an R71 and C24 commercial overlay. This action will allow for the construction of one eight story um, entirely affordable housing building with approximately 107 units plus one unit for super and approximately 9,793 square feet of ground floor commercial space. Land use number 684 is related to the proposed project that would be developed under HPD's extremely low and low affordab affordability low um, income program known as ELLA. The ELLA program provides to create rental housing to low income families with a range of incomes from 30% to 80% of the area median income. Projects may include 
a portion of the units with rents affordable to households earning up to 100% EMI. Projects also include units rented to formerly homeless families and individuals. Development site located at 1510 Broadway will be developed by sponsors selected through a competitive process geared towards certified MWBE organizations. The, propose, the proposal includes the construction of an eight-story mixed-use building with 107 rental units plus a supers unit. Under MIH option one, 25% of the residential floor area must be permanently affordable housing units, um, affordable to households with income at a weighted average of 60% of AMI. Under MIH option two, 30% of the residential floor area must be permanently aff affordable housing units, affordable to households with incomes at a weighted average of 80% of AMI. Additionally, as per HPD's requirement, an additional 15% of the units will be permanently affordable. Therefore, based on the number of rental units for this project, 16 units will be permanently affordable in addition to the MIH units for a total of 43 permanently affordable units. The building will comprise a mixture of studios, one, two, and three bedroom apartments. 15% of the unit count will be set aside for homeless households. Targeted incomes will range from up to 30% AMI to 80% AMI, which equates to approximately $17,307 um, a year in salary to $88,800. Um, Rents will range from $362 to $2,037 um, depending on household income and family size. The project also includes approximately 9,793 square feet of ground floor retail space. The building will be constructed to meet enterprise green and LEED standards. Amenities include spaces for residential bicycle storage on the ground floor, laundry facilities and recreational spaces. Additionally, the project includes reserving space for future construction of an ADA elevator adjacent to the Halsey Street subway entrance. In order to facilitate development of 1510 Broadway and the creation of affordable housing units, HPD is before the council seeking approval of land use numbers 682, 683, 684, and 685. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Rella Boliano. She's gonna give a, a brief introduction to the development team and um, before Stacy Gluck, as uh, Stacy Wong from Gluck Plus will go over the presentation, um, the, the visual presentation of the project. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Good morning. I'm Rella Fogliano, principal of McQuestion Development. This project was awarded to us in 2017 under an MWBE RFP through the city of New York. I am, or I should say McQuestion is very dedicated to the city of New York in providing affordable housing. We've been doing so since 1992. We're very excited that this day has come. I want to thank all of the council members, but especially council member Samuels, who has been supportive of this project. And we hope to bring this to fruition and make the community very proud uh, in every development that we do. We are very much engaged with the community. And uh, again, Happy to be here and thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Stacy Wong. I'm open to questions later on, of course, but uh, I'm going to open this to Stacy Wong, our architect, to uh, lead you through all of the essential uh, aspects of this project. Thank you. Thanks, Rella. Uh, so I, I don't see the slideshow up. Um, I'm not sure if everybody else sees it. Oh, there it goes. Coming up, yep. There's going to be okay. a slight delay. Okay, so no problem. Just say next, and you know, sometimes it'll take a few seconds. But okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Stacy Wong. I'm a principal at Gluck Plus Architecture. I'm the architects for this project. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide, please. On the screen is a list of requested land use actions that was discussed in the testimony by Lin Zeng. Uh, HPD and DCAS are the applicants, and the application was certified on December 2nd, 2019. Uh, the site was designated to McQuestion Development LLC under HPD's MWBE RFP. 
representing the city's efforts to build capacity with minority and women-owned businesses. Next slide. This is an aerial view of the subject vacant city-owned site. It is located within Brooklyn's Community District 16 and borders Community Districts 3 and 4. The surrounding area includes a variety of building types from low-scale one- and two-family homes to higher-scale 13 and 16-story NYCHA buildings nearby. The site fronts Broadway, which can be characterized as local, commercial, and retail, and is adjacent to the J. Halsey Street subway station and the elevated Jay-Z subway line that runs along Broadway. Next slide, please. And this is a project overview of the proposed development. Approval of the proposed actions will facilitate the development of approximately 107 units of affordable housing, serving low-income families and individuals. It will include ground floor commercial space that will activate vacant city-owned land on a portion of Broadway that has long been overshadowed by the elevated subway. And approval of this project also paves the way for a new building that has been designed to include space reserved for a future ADA improvement to the adjacent subway station. Uh, next slide, please. The development is approximately 116,000 gross square feet or 98,000 zoning square feet over eight floors above grade and a partial cellar. The trapezoidal site um, shaped site is bordered by Broadway and the elevated J train along the top of the slide. <clears throat> Jefferson and Saratoga Avenues on the left and Hancock Street to the right. The site is well served by transit um, with a bus stop in front of the site as well as city bikes across the street. The unit mix is comprised of 7% studios, 44% one bedrooms and the remaining 48% being two and three bedrooms to provide family sized affordable units for the neighborhood. Next slide. This ground floor plan has added color to better illustrate the allocation of space. In blue is approximately 10,000 square feet of commercial floor area located exclusively along Broadway with approximately 700 square feet of that set aside for local arts and cultural nonprofit organizations. The blue arrows indicate the multiple possible entries to these spaces, which is critical to reinforcing Broadway as the retail and transit corridor for the neighborhood. In purple is the off-street loading berth serving the commercial floor area, and it's located mid-block on Hancock, as far from the street intersection as possible. The remainder of the ground floor space in yellow is allocated to residential floor area, including two residential um, lobbies, six apartments, and accessory spaces, spaces such as indoor resident bike storage. And the red arrows on either corner indicate the two residential entrances at the corners of the site. The ground floor apartments are concentrated along Hancock and Saratoga to remove them as far as possible from the elevated train infrastructure. And the residential street wall at the ground floor has been set back from the property line and will be planted um, with vegetation to further buffer those ground floor apartments from the sidewalk. And on the upper right hand corner of, this, uh, of the project, you can see a small gray square um, facing Broadway and this space is for a future MTA elevator to access the adjacent Halsey Street station platform. And this space will be concealed behind the building facade and inaccessible until such time an elevator can be constructed. No parking is required for the commercial space nor for affordable units in a transit zone and none, um, no parking is provided. Next slide. This is a view of the project from Broadway. The design incorporates a building setback after the ground floor to provide maximum distance between the elevated train and the residential units on the second through the eighth floors. The goal is to maximize daylight and views for every apartment and avoid apartments directly overlooking the subway platform. This setback also allows for an outdoor courtyard amenity for all residents, which is at the heart of the building. At approximately 7,000 square feet, the courtyard would include landscaping, pavers, seating, and a children's play area. And the indoor resident recreation room and common laundry room are centrally located on that second floor adjacent to the courtyard. This building setback also has the added benefit of being visible and distinctive when walking along Broadway, allowing daylight to come down to the sidewalk level and creating a unique sense of place on the city block. 
the ground floor design incorporates large expanses of glazing, approximately 11 foot high, light colored ground faced masonry and a darker tone signage band and mullions to provide, provide transparency, visual variety and contrast. And dark sky compliant light fixtures are located along those masonry panels for both a safer pedestrian experience as well as visual interest on the building facade in the evening. Multiple commercial entry points as well as a signage band along the length of the building allows for retail tenant space that is open, visible, flexible and viable for a variety of commercial tenants. Next slide. And this is a view of the building from Saratoga Avenue. The residential entry and lobby are located at the corner at the lower left hand um, uh, spot on the image. And the ground floor apartments are all buffered with plantings within that street wall setback. The overall building expression is inspired by the neighborhood context. Although there is a 16 story NYCHA residential tower across the street, and you can see that at the far right of this image, the neighborhood fabric is actually predominantly three to four story townhomes in multiple colors. Our project used the neighborhood's townhome fabric as inspiration and articulated the building massing and facade material treatment to reference the vertical proportions of a townhouse module. Each townhome is clad in a different tone of white and gray with the exception of a few townhomes clad in a brighter color. Next slide. The project will be financed through HPD's ELLA program and will serve household, um, households earning between 30 to 80% of AMI with a 15% set aside for formerly homeless population. Household annual incomes range from approximately $17,000 to $88,000. And at least 50% of the units will be below 50% AMI. Nearly half of the units will be family sized two and three bedroom units and um, the building um, and the apartments will remain affordable for 60 years. Next slide. McQuesten Development has partnered with the Local Development Corporation of East New York, who has served the East Brooklyn community for over 40 years. The team has a robust plan for local hiring and MWBE hiring. They have um, very strong community outreach and connections that are supported by um, their partnerships with workforce development groups their large database of local and MWBE businesses in the building trades, and their um, commitment also to certifying at least 12 new MWBE companies per year. The team also has a strong marketing plan to reach local residents as future tenants, utilizing their vast network. And as an HPD housing ambassador, they have deep experience working with people to help them prepare and apply for the affordable housing lotteries. Next slide. And this slide just uh, shows the ULERP timeline um, uh, based on where we are today, September 24th um, at the city council hearing. And I think I will um, open it up to uh, questions and the other um, applicant panelists to be able to answer specific and uh, more detailed questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. Um, Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm gonna take uh, just a quick couple of questions before uh, I turn it over to council member Ampri Samuels and uh, some other council members who may have some questions. I just wanna get back to uh, talking about uh, the elevated, uh, the, the, the train that goes by uh, on Broadway. Uh, did you, uh, and you might've mentioned it, I'm sorry if I missed it. Is the building being designed uh, to help uh, reduce uh, the noise admissions into the apartments? Stacy, I think. You just gotta unmute yourself. Yeah, just. Go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Okay, Stacey. great, perfect, thank yeah. you. Um, so yes, the building is going to be designed to deal with the sounds, um, the sound from the elevated train. Um, the EAS for the building actually stipulated very specific window and wall noise attenuation criteria for the building. Um, the apartments facing the train actually have a stricter criteria and very specific criteria than the um, facades uh, not facing the elevated train. And, um, the criteria? Um, what was the criteria? 
Can you just, what was the criteria you said? I'm sorry. Sure. So um, the EAS stipulated a window wall noise attenuation of 33 dBA for um, the building facades facing the train and a 31 dBA for the facades facing Saratoga and Hancock. And so when we're, um, in essence, in order to achieve that, we find in uh, a composite OITC um, rating for um, the solid wall, the windows, and the PTEC units combined to make sure that we're meeting that criteria. And so on, um, we've worked on a couple of different projects in very close proximity to um, uh, elevated subway lines and um, are very comfortable with um, very specific products for windows um, uh, that have certain OITC ratings, um, as well as for the PTEX, um, there are special sound attenuation packages that can be ordered for these PTEC units. And then the solid wall with the, these components get um, analyzed by our acoustic consultant to be able to um, show that it's meeting the criteria stipulated in EAS. Great. And um, towards the end of the presentation, you're talking about local hires and MWBEs. Um, can you describe what the plan for the local hires uh, is going to be in construction? And how many local hires would typically be involved in a project like this? And I think I'm going to pass this on to, over to Bill Wilkins, who um, uh, uh, represents the LDC of East New York, and there he is. Okay. Hey, Bill. Yes, um, thank you very much for, for, for the question, Councilman. Um, as it relates to, to local hires, we have worked on several development projects in the past, and what we try to do is, is a deep dive into the respective zip code and use um, an extensive database of job-ready individuals that we um, are in contact with different workforce develop, developer, pro, de, actual well, workforce develop providers um, that have the necessary OSHA training. Um, we try to, um, as comprehensively as possible, use a hyper-local approach um, as it relates to working locally with some of our companies in the building trade and also hiring locally, and more importantly, having residents locally secure these apartments. So, so give me, just like, give me an example. You're saying you've worked with, with, with the building trade in the past. Um, give, me, give me an example of what uh, that looked like in different projects. How many local hires were there? And then if you can, my second question was, uh, how many local hires would typically be involved in a project like this? Well, um, I'll say it, it's a fluid process. It's, it's a little um, difficult to give you a hard number, but in the past, as far as um, labor is, we were able to secure about 15 to 20 people. If you include um, the security detail, then that number increases to 25. Also, it depends upon who you're using as the contractors and the subcontractors, because they also hire locally. But it's something, it's something that is very important to us. It's paramount because as you know, um, District 16 and Brownsville, we have um, a significant, a very high unemployment rate. So anytime there's an employment opportunity, we, leaked, we look to um, source those opportunities with local people. Great. And I'm sorry that I'm gonna keep covering on this, but you said 25. I, I know. I would, Many. Excuse me? Project. You said typically you hired 25. You gave an example of 25 construction workers. Like, out of what was the number of construction well, jobs? Yeah, like that? Okay, to answer specifically, there should be about 150 construction jobs. Um, post construction retail, there should be 20, and then there's three in building services. Okay. Uh, and, but for, for so that is that what you're giving me this number for what the size of this project would be? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank That's you. That's an aggregate. Yes. Okay. So got it. And then uh, just like how do we ensure follow up uh, and the progress report uh, on these commitments? 
Well, the progress report, um, that would be ongoing communications with the councilwoman and also with District 16, um, that we made representations that we intend on keeping, and we will then periodically be reporting and also asking them for, for help and guidance as it relates to securing these opportunities. So the process is fluid and our commitment to the community stands over four decades. Right, no, so, look, what yeah, I'm, so, I'm saying so, how, how, as we go forward. Right. I'm sorry, I think I'm echoing a little bit, but um, I just want to uh, make sure that um, there is a actual process here that is monitored and you know, that the councilwoman uh, be there uh, for that. I'm going to figure out what's happening technically with me here. Uh, that was the last question anyway. I'm going to now turn it over to Council Member uh, Ambry Samuels um, for her questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Chair Moya, for um, those questions. That was also part of my um, line of questioning. And it's always related to opportunities for employment um, on the site during the process across all jobs. Um, but I will say that we have a great relationship with Mr. Wilkins. And when I say we, I mean um, myself and the state assemblywoman. And um, this is for you, Chair Moyo. He's always in the hot seat when he's in our offices. And so um, we make sure that um, you know, things are moving accordingly. And so, um, but this is something that's always of great concern for us um, because historically we'll have developers come in and say what they're going to do and then not do it. You know, there's always some kind of an excuse as to why um, it's difficult to hire locally. And it's everything from, we can't find folks with the proper certifications to licenses and oh, they left. And so it's more than just providing um, folks from our community with a job opportunity, but also all of the soft skills training that goes along with being able to keep the job. Um, um, so with that, I'll move on. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you're partnering with any local organizations um, as the administering agents for the affordable housing units themselves? Um, and I say that because with affordable housing deals, we'll see, you know, possibly a list in a newspaper or on Housing Connect, um, and maybe a couple of ads on social media, but that's it. So, and that's never enough. You know, there's always people from someplace else that might be able to qualify for the units and still move in. And so we want to make sure that the folks from the community are the ones that are not only applying for the apartments, but have the necessary um, paperwork to be able to complete the process and move in. So can you speak a little bit about how you'll be able to work with the organization to make sure that the people get into the apartments as well? Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you very much for, for the question. Um, I think that we have developed um, a model that really works because as you know, um, an asset coming online like this, what we don't want is for our local residents to say, I didn't know about it. I didn't have any opportunity to go on Housing Connect. So what we do, we have um, one of our local businesses um, actually is the marketeer and they provide those door hangers. So what we do is we saturate the community with over 20 to 30,000 announcements and we send it also twice. And we produce probably about 50,000 flyers and we go to local stakeholders, also local electeds um, and make presentations at the community board so that everyone knows because we would like to see the super saturated not with just 50% of the residents of CB16, but we'd like to see that number even higher. Even though traditionally, when something of this nature goes online, a project of this nature goes online, we'll see about 60 to 65,000 responses. But we found it very effective by using these door hangers because they go into our public housing complexes and we do the drop about two or three times. 
And I will so I will um, highlight the fact that McQuesten is allowing us to provide this this service because it is a course where we find it to be very effective. Other developers sometimes will say no, and they'll allude to the methodology that you stated. But this way, we have this hyper local approach to reaching our local residents. I'd like to add something, to, Bill. Thank you very much. You're so eloquent as always. Uh, I also want to uh, be uh, forthcoming. We d we do that in advance because we 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 are held to doing a lottery. Um, but all of the actions that Bill is discussing is talking about with the community will be two weeks ahead of the opening of the lottery so that there will be ample time for the, the residents in the community to be aware. Um, there is also going to be a 50% set aside so uh, for community residents. Um, and once that's filled, that's when we look at applicants outside of the community. Okay, thanks. I'm struggling with unmuting myself. Uh -huh. um, um, so that's great. The outreach is very necessary. You know, of course, across the street from this development, we have um, family shelters. And then, the, as you mentioned, your presentation right next door, there's a NYCHA tower. Um, and so we always hear public housing residents, you know, saying, well, there's this brand new shiny building being built right next door and I can't get in. And so I appreciate the outreach effort. And my, my last question is clearly, and I've said this a thousand times in our meetings, um, can you speak a little bit about the commercial space and the community facility uses? Um, the commercial space in particular, because this will be ground retail. I know there's a grocery store across the street and I always talk about access to um, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables, um, but also you know my disdain for 99 cent stores and the fact that Broadway has a thousand ninety-nine cent stores. Um, so, can you please talk to us a little bit about um, any potential tenants for the commercial space, and again, speak a little bit about the community facilities? And then that's it, Chair Moya, for me. Joe Apicella, would you like to speak to that? Yes, I would. I was just unmuted. Uh, thank you, everyone, and I hope everyone's uh, staying safe and healthy. Um, on the retail, uh, Rella and I have been involved in retail recruitment and marketing for mixed-use projects like this for many years. There's the great complexity of the uncertainty of these times. So we have been working with uh, the LDC of East New York and Bill to focus first uh, council member on looking at some banking institutions because there's a dearth of banking institutions in the area. And Bill will speak in a moment to in greater detail to the specific outreach that we have made uh, not successful yet. Having said that, we also consider ourselves at McQuesten to be nimble, something Rella uh, prides herself on. So we're working with uh, commercial brokers that have done, had great success in the area and we're focusing on things that we think can work today, such as uh, there's a tremendous need, believe it or not, for birthing centers uh, with people, uh, pregnant women hesitant to give birth in hospitals. They're looking for alternative facilities, which is a new, uh, a new opportunity. Childcare, childcare is a tremendous need today with the school scenarios and the like in the era of COVID. So we are working feverishly in order to try to find a, an appropriate commercial user that's economically viable and also provides a real service to the community and to our new residents and the residents of the area. The um, city planning prior to this asked us the question, well, we understand the complexity of marketing in this environment. What do we do if we have a protracted vacancy? And what we provided to them was a detailed plan of how we could temporarily engage the community 
through the LDC of East New York, working with Bill Wilkins uh, to do what we've done elsewhere, which is to have uh, contests, arts contests, mural contests, to activate that storefront and to make it look viable uh, in the absence of a tenant. And we would employ, in the alternative as a last resort, that technique to keep the building vibrant and marketable. Bill? Okay, thank you, Joe. Yes, um, when we were in front of the community board and, and prior to that, we did an analysis on Broadway as to what type of retail options were void on that commercial strip. And number one was a banking institution. So Joe and I rolled up our sleeves. We reached out to Bank of America. We reached out to Chase, reached out to TD Bank and Investors Bank because some of those entities are rolling out and opening up more branches. Unfortunately, we weren't able to curry the favor that we wanted, but I think it also allows us for an opportunity to revisit those financial institutions because that's what's needed on Broadway. That would be a coup. This building is really going to help to anchor and stabilize Broadway from, from its design vantage point and also for the opportunity being so close to um, an MTA facility, an MTA station. So we still really like to see a bank and we're really going to keep pushing on that and use whatever methods we can to at least have those conversations as we go forward. Well, thank you so much um, for the work that you've done thus far. And I look forward to the continued process. Um, Chair Moya, that's all I have. Thank you, council member. Um, I now want to take this opportunity to invite my colleagues uh, to ask uh, questions. And just as a reminder, uh, if you have questions uh, for the applicant panel, please click the raise hand button on the participant panel. Uh, council, are there uh, any council members that have any questions? I see that we have council member Reynoso. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Moya. Uh, can I? Should I start? Yep, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I just want to, I, I would love to be able to go back to the screen that shows the rents um, that are going to be uh, be given here or, or that are going to exist here. Um, because uh, I made a statement earlier on about the, the segregation that exists in our city and how black and brown communities uh, tend to bear the burden of having to build all the affordable housing. And it's extraordinary how we can have two projects that are so different um, in one day be presented to us. And I just want to, whatever negotiation Council Member Ampro Samuel was doing, uh, the work that this developer is doing, it really is a breath of fresh air to know that people are out here trying um, to figure out, and that's my son in the background, I apologize, to figure out this crisis. Uh, but to think about, um, the formerly homeless uh, set aside and that uh, people making, two people making a minimum wage here are gonna be able to get, uh, have a, a, a comfortable, beautiful home. This is, a, uh, this is across the, uh, the street from my district. So the only thing that I'm upset about that it's that it's not in my district. So again, I just, I'm really proud of the work that Councilman Rapper Sammy is doing here. Um, thank you guys so much. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, to voting on this in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Um, uh, council, are there any other council members with any questions? Chair Moya, uh, I see no other members with questions at this time. Okay. Uh, there being no further questions for this panel, uh, the panel is now excused. Um, Thank you very much for uh, your participation today. And uh, I ask, are there any members of the public who wish to testify uh, on 1510 Broadway uh, rezoning application? The, the panel is excused, thank you. If there are members of the public who wish to testify on LU numbers 682 through 685 for the 1510 Broadway rezoning, please press the raise hand button now. Uh, the meeting will now stand at ease while we check for members of the public.
Chair Moya, I see no members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Great. Uh, there being no members of the public uh, who wish to testify, uh, the public hearing on LU's 682 through 685 for the 1510 Broadway rezoning is now closed. Uh, the next item uh, that we will hear is for LU 680 for the three St. Mark's Place special permit application uh, relating to property located in Council Member Rivera's district in Manhattan. The applicant seeks approval for a special permit pursuant to section 74, uh, uh, 79 of the rezoning resolution to facilitate the construction of a 10 story building located at three St. Mark's Place in the East Village neighborhood of Manhattan. The special permit would allow the transfer of approximately 8,400 square feet of development rights from the designated individual landmark site across the street at four St. Mark's Place known as the Hamilton Holly House if approved, the special permit would modify the applicable bulk uh, provisions to allow the proposed new building to uh, penetrate the maximum front wall height and the sky exposure plane at the uh, St. Mark's Place uh, footage, frontage, sorry. Uh, and now I would like to recognize uh, my colleague, uh, Council Member Rivera um, for the statement. Uh, Chair Moya, I will forego my statement so we can get into the presentation if that's okay. Perfect. Thank you, Council Member Rivera. And uh, Council, if you could please uh, call the first panel uh, for this item. The applicant panel for this item will include Ted Robottom, appearing on behalf of the sponsor, Real Estate Equities Corporation. Applicant panelist, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request uh, in order to begin to speak. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank second. you, everybody. One, one second. Uh, Council, if you could please um, administer the affirmation. Mr. Robot, please raise your right hand. <clears throat> Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all subcommittee, uh, answer to all council member questions? Uh, I do. Okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, thank you. It just again, just state your name and the affirmation for the record. Um, I just wanted to, do, do you have a, a presentation? I do not, I, I do not. Uh, Chair Moy, I was gonna read a statement. <clears throat> so I'll just say that uh, this is a first for me. Uh, I've been chairing this for now close to three and a half years. I've never seen an applicant uh, come to a public hearing, uh, not prepared with the presentation. Um, you know, the subcommittee, uh, in general is accustomed to seeing some type of, of visual presentation for these types of projects. Uh, so this is a very unusual situation. Um, but before you begin, my question is, are you going to be able to answer questions regarding the proposal uh, from the subcommittee members and take us through your rationale uh, for seeking this approval? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that I'm able to answer today. Okay. You may begin. Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, so good morning and uh, thank you everybody for, uh, you know, giving us the opportunity to speak today. Um, you know, I have a couple things to say. Um, you know, since day one on, on this project on St. Mark's, which, um, you know, almost marks uh, three, three years ago uh, from today, we've always been, what we, what we've felt is, uh, you know, thoughtful and, and considerate about our design uh, and how it relates to the surrounding neighborhood. You know, as a nod to the neighborhood's aesthetic, uh, we designed one of uh, the only brick office buildings in the immediate area in hopes that the community would support uh, the contextual significance um, of the area. Um, and it's very important that, you know, the community understands that we did not have to do this. Um, we could have built a, you know, very large glass building as of right, similar in size um, without any public approval whatsoever. Um, but out of respect for the character and the history of the neighborhood, we, we decided not to. 
Um, moreover, we could have designed an 85 foot street wall um, that did not match the height of the adjacent buildings along St. Mark's, um, which definitely would have seemed uh, out of character. Um, but again, we, we decided not to do that. Instead, uh, you know, we reached out to multiple preservation groups. We incorporated community feedback and invested a significant amount of time and funds redesigning every little detail. Um, we were asked to work with Lespy on the design, uh, which we had done for uh, months. Um, originally opposing our development, they changed their position to actually neutral, um, which we felt was a very significant move uh, on their part. But aside from the design elements, you know, we proactively decided to help reshape for St. Mark's, which is obviously, as everybody knows, the Hamilton Holly House across the street. Um, and as many of you know, <laughs> this is one of the oldest and most historic buildings on St. Mark's Place. And this building really stood to benefit from a long lasting continual maintenance program if our application was approved. Uh, this would have brought the building into, you know, very sound first class condition and, and, you know, unfortunately we cannot make that commitment any longer and therefore cannot really guarantee that this building that, you know, was constructed in the early 1800s will retain its prominence. Uh, we made extensive efforts and reached out several times to uh, Council Member, Member Rivera. Um, we offered jobs, employment training and education, uh, more design tweaks, uh, but we felt that these offers were largely not considered. Um, nothing was even proposed back from the office that you know, we heard that would benefit the community. Um, and we feel that this is not only a major disservice to us, but you know, also to the general public and more importantly to the East Village. Um, it should also be noted that the majority of the public testimony focuses on not just, you know, not wanting the development um, or our project at all. And it really doesn't focus on the nature of the application and the air rights transfer that we're applying for. Um, and, you know, the reality here is that a, a building is going to be built. And so why not take advantage of the benefits that we can offer the community as the developer as opposed to really just saying no and having nothing in return. Um, so, you know, in short, uh, we're very disappointed that, uh, you know, our application didn't receive the support that uh, it needed. Um, and we felt that this minor, you know, 8,000 square foot transfer, which really wouldn't even be noticeable uh, to the naked eye from the street, uh, could have rewarded the, the community. Um, it would create the additional jobs, uh, tax revenue, and an economic injection at a retail level that not only the neighborhood needs, but the, the city desperately needs uh, right now. Um, so as of today, the project's under construction, it will be built, and right now there's no public benefit in place. Um, and in this incredibly difficult times that, you know, everybody's living in, it seems only logical and practical to me and to us to endorse a project that you know, can help the neighborhood, its residents, and the city overall uh, with additional tax revenue that will be generated by just a slightly larger building. Uh, so despite the negative feedback on our application, our position remains that, you know, we are in support of the community and we're ready, willing, and able to offer something back to the neighborhood during during this difficult time. Um, so with that, I, I, I thank everybody and, um, you know, we appreciate your consideration. Thanks. Just a couple of questions before I turn it over to Councilmember Rivera, because I, I, I don't really think you addressed, you know, and talked about the findings here. So let's go back to, to the basics. You have a DOB approval, uh, and I understand that some work has already begun uh, on site. So to me, um, and to most, I think it seems that you have an as of right option that is feasible uh, and can work for you financially. Uh, so could you talk about what brings you here today and your basic justification uh, in terms of the required findings for the special permit? And you're going to mute yourself when you're ready to answer. No, hold on. Okay, that, thank you. Thank you, Chair Moore. Um, yeah, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but um, I'll go back. You know, yeah, yeah, please. Okay, you have an as of right. 
okay, you've already invested money financially into this. Correct. Um, they, it could actually work for you if you just do your as of right. So talk to me why you're here today, your basic uh, justification in terms of the required findings for the special permit. Sure. So uh, we're, we're here today uh, exercising um, an air rights transfer from a building across the street, right? Um, and that building is for St. Mark's. And the reason we're here today is to, in hopes of getting that application approved, so we can continually maintain and help the landmark, uh, the landmark building at Fort St. Mark's um, by approving our, our 8,000 square foot transfer. Uh, so, okay. Uh, I'm gonna go back to something else, but could you explain the difference between the proposed building envelope uh, and the permitted as of right envelope under the C61 zoning? So the as of right, uh, the as of right would be a uh, nine story building chair, Moya. Um, it's generally the same type of building, um, same type of envelope, but it will be one story uh, lower. Um, the street wall will generally be the same. Um, and I believe also the max height of the building will, will also be the same. Um, but the bulk, um, the bulk of the building will be a little less dense. Hope that I hope that answers your question. No, oh, but um, what, what? So let me move on to something else right now. Uh, what plans do you have for uh, local hiring or MW, MWBE uh, participation in terms of construction? Well, that would be part of the application, right? So if you know we had reached out uh, to Council Member Rivera and we had. Um, what I thought offered that, um, and we, you know, did not receive uh, really any sort of feedback about what we should be doing to help. Um, so that's that's sort of how I so would respond. What to you're that. saying is uh, because you didn't uh, hear from the councilwoman, which is you know uh, like one of the more diligent council members that we have here, uh, you're telling me you don't have a plan for local hires. You don't have an idea of how that's gonna get built out. Your MWBE process to this, there is none. Is that what you're we saying? Offer, we, we offered to follow, I believe we offered to follow an MWBE uh, process. We offered to hire local workers. What, what, what is that process? Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure what you mean, but. What's, what's your process for uh, hiring MWBEs, what is the process that you're taking for uh, the local hires? How many would that be? This is a normal question that gets asked in projects that are being built. Right. Yeah. So, so I think it's pretty clear, by the way, I'm, uh, I, don't, I don't know where the confusion is. Yeah. So, um, you know, look, we, we had offered to hire local workers. We had offered to go through an MWBE program. And that was largely ignored. Um, so we didn't run a full process because we weren't told that this process would help our application. So what you're saying is in order to help your application process, that's the only way you would go for local hires and MWBEs? Uh, that, not at all. That would incentivize that's, us. That's, that would incentivize you. Okay. So this is not something that you would just do on a normal basis of any development that you're going into in looking at local hires and MWBE contractors. Yeah, we, we always look for local hires. Um, we hired a local architect. Um, the architect you just finished saying, and I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, you just finished saying that, is, are you all right? I am fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you're just saying that the incentive is if you get uh, the local council member to agree to something, you don't actually do this on your own. Um, no, no, that's not, um, maybe I'm being misunderstood. No, um, I, I am saying that we are happy to hire local workers. We have already hired local workers. 
um, but we are happy to hire more and we're happy to offer more community engagement and, and, and more involvement with the community if we receive some level of feedback uh, from Council Member Rivera um, about our application. Okay. Um, it's my last question, uh, and then I'll turn it over to Council Member Rivera. Uh, what kind of tenants uh, or businesses do you envision uh, occupying the building? Uh, and what plans, if any, do you have for attracting local businesses or organizations, uh, whether it's for retail space at the ground floor or for the uh, upper floors uh, that deal with the office space? Yeah, to be to be honest, you know, currently right now, um, we, we don't know. Um, right now, it's just the hole in the ground. Um, we are planning to start our foundation uh, pretty soon, but it really won't be until probably two years until the building is delivered, Chair Moya. Um, so, you know, but largely we envision this to be hopefully local businesses that are occupying the office space. So, you know, uh, uh, one or two local businesses that are occupying the, the uh, retail space on, on, the, on the first level. Um, I'm gonna now turn it over to Council Member Rivera, but I will say that uh, it is extremely disappointing that um, you've come here today with no presentation, uh, extremely disappointed in hearing your answer about local hires and MWBEs. Um, that, that says a lot. Uh, I had not had made up my mind on what the, we were going with this project. But, uh, these two things are heavily weighing on me now uh, and seeing the way that uh, you've come in here uh, not prepared uh, to really answer these questions and give a thorough presentation um, for this uh, rezoning. So with that, I want to uh, turn it over to uh, Council Member Rivera for questions. Thank you so much, Chair Moya. Um, I'm sorry, it's a little dark and I don't see your name. So I, I just wanted to ask, were you in any of the previous meetings that we had pre-COVID in person or via teleconference when we had these conversations? I think someone has to unmute the applicant. Uh, I, I personally was not. Okay, because I was a little taken aback by your comments of of meetings. We've had multiple meetings with the applicant, and I'm I'm sorry you missed it. You must be new to the process. So again, I just want to reiterate uh, what Chair Moya just said, which was how disappointed that you did not come with any presentation, which is something we have not seen in I don't know th over three years in the council. Um, with me being on the zoning committee. I guess I'll ask you some, you know, let me just get right to, we did ask about community space. We did ask about affordable housing. Sometimes the applicant, and you wouldn't know because you weren't in any of the conversations, but sometimes the applicant said jobs. Um, there was really no commitment there. There was no process. I, I'm a little also, I guess, disappointed or just kind of puzzled as to why I should be the one to tell you how to commit to creating good jobs and having MWBE uh, vendors and tenants. It's uh, startling even. Um, I would also say that when the applicant was asked by community board three about housing and community space, the applicant said it wasn't an option. So that was a little quick history lesson for you. And I'm gonna get into my questions. So the proposal is for a special permit to waive some of the height and setback regulations at the St. Mark's frontage of the building. St. Mark's place is 60 feet wide, which makes it a, a narrow street under zoning. What consideration, if any, was given to shifting the bulk to the third avenue frontage, which at 100 feet is a wide street under zoning and seeking the bulk relief on that side? Uh, yeah, so we, um, you know, what I, I hope this answers the question, but we basically were trying to uh, keep the street wall at, uh, I believe, 65 feet 
um, which uh, to, to your point, Council Member Rivera, I think matches the height of the adjacent buildings along St. Mark's. Um, so I think as of right, we could have gone up to uh, an 85 foot height, um, but instead we designed a building that would be, I believe 65 or 60 feet um, along St. Mark's to match contextually and conform to the rest of the uh, St. Mark's buildings uh, to the east of us. Well, this is a relatively rare instance where an owner seeks relief through this particular permit, the, the 74-79 special permit. Are you familiar with prior examples of this permit? Can you tell us about prior examples that have been sought outside of a central business district or adjacent to a residential district? Uh, I, I, I cannot, I'm not a zoning attorney. I'm not a land use attorney, um, but I, you know, happy to try and provide examples by going back to somebody like that. Okay. When the Sitting Planning Commission originally adopted the special permit text in 1968, they wrote of a desire to promote architecture that will relate and enrich the areas around landmark sites and not be detrimental to its surroundings. How do you believe your development proposal achieves this? Um, so I think it, it achieves this in um, a few ways. Um, like I said, you know, before in the beginning, um, we are building one of the only brick-based office buildings, um, you know, in our in our immediate area. Um, you know, across the street on Astor, um, you know, 51 Astor obviously was a massive glass office building. Um, we felt that our project should not be designed like that. Um, and we really wanted it to conform to the rest of the buildings on St. Mark's. So um, we did that by uh, not doing much glass, minimizing the, the glass impact and um, maximizing a, a, a special brick that we imported. Understood. Um, again, I just want to express um, my disappointment, uh, the lack of the presentation the tone of your comments and just not being at the meetings where we really did sit down multiple times and trying to figure out how this was something that made sense, which I, you know, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the questions. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman uh, Rivera. Um, I want to now, uh, check with our council to uh, see if there's any other uh, council members uh, that may have questions. Chair Moya, I see no members with uh, additional questions at this time. Okay. Um, so I want to I want to thank you for your testimony today, but uh, I want to reiterate this for the record uh, that this is uh, something that. Uh, really is very disappointing, um, you know, the inability uh, to answer uh, questions that dealt with the bulk and the insufficiency of those answers, uh, the lack of presentation um, is something that uh, really has set a, a bad tone here. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that we have that on the record. Uh, with that, I want to thank you for uh, being here. Uh, and uh, now I'm going to uh, dismiss this panel and turn to our council, uh, being that there is no uh, other council members um, with any more questions. Um, council, do we have any um, members of the public now who wish to testify? Uh, yes, Chair. Yes, Chair Moya, we have approximately uh, 12 public witnesses who have signed up to speak. The first witness to testify will be New York State Senator Brad Hoylman. If we still have the Senator, he will be the first witness to testify. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair Moya, and thank you, uh, Councilor. Just, well, just one second before you start. Yes. Uh, good to see you, Senator. Hope you're doing well. 
uh, I just want to make sure that uh, the council uh, will uh, swear you in uh, oh. before you begin. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. You're right. Percent. Sorry, you're, you're good to go, Senator. My apologies. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. Well, uh, since thank, thank you, thank you, Chair Moria, and thank you, uh, Councilmember Rivera. Uh, since we're talking about, in part, Alexander Hamilton uh, and the Hamilton Holly House, I just want you to know that it's good to be in the Zoom where it happened. I hope you appreciated that. Um, I just uh, again wanted to thank the council uh, and for this opportunity. I'm I'm testifying briefly today. Uh, on behalf of myself and assembly member uh, Deborah Glick um, about the proposed uh, transfer of uh, over 8,000 square feet of air rights from the landmark uh, for St. Mark's Place, the Hamilton Holly House, to the site across the street at Three Marks Place. Um, if approved, this transfer uh, could result in the construction of a 10-story building we know at the corner of St. Mark's Place and Third Avenue in the East Village neighborhood that we represent that we think will be entirely out of character on a historic block with mostly four and five story buildings. So we join uh, the council member with her concerns along with community board three, uh, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, neighborhood preservationists uh, and residents and strongly urging you to vote against this application. Uh, the application also proposes to modify the height and setback requirements as you know uh, of the zoning block, which would allow the developers to penetrate the maximum front wall height in the, the sky exposure plane. And while the proposed uh, agreement would create a fund for the ongoing maintenance of the historic Hamilton Holly House, uh, we believe that 5% is really a paltry sum in relation to what the community is being asked to accept. We have deep reservations uh, regarding the terms of the transfer for this project and the legitimacy of a change to the zoning resolution that will facilitate the construction of a building with about twice as many stories as others on this historic block. Um, just wanted to also say that we fully support the sentiments raised by the borough president uh, in her February 2020 ULUP recommendation and by Community Board 3 in their December 2019 resolution opposing this application, uh, as well as groups such as the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation and the East Village Community Coalition. We, thank them for their advocacy and outspokenness uh, on this important issue. And while the developers may be willing to allocate an amount for the perpetual maintenance of the Hamilton Holly House, it doesn't seem to exist a guarantee that further development won't put the historic house at risk. Uh, moreover, the plan to help fund the preservation uh, of the historic Hamilton House uh, is represented as the public benefit. Um, it does not account for the broader concept context of the neighborhood whose unique character is constantly threatened by the development process. Um, so long and short, um, we oppose this application. Uh, uh, we think the Hamilton Holly House should be preserved on merit for being a notable structure in our community that represents an important part of New York City history, not necessarily because a sale of air rights made that possible. For these reasons, we ask you to vote against this application. And again, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for your time. Thank you, Senator. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Miss you in Albany. <laughs> same, same here. Uh, uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, if any council members have any questions for this witness, uh, please indicate by uh, using the raise hand button. Seeing none, right? Uh, okay, there will be no further council member questions uh, for this witness. Uh, now I'll turn it over to uh, our council. For members of the public who are testifying today, please note that once you have completed your testimony, you will be removed from the meeting as the next speaker is introduced. At that time, you may continue to view the live stream broadcast uh, of the hearing at the council's website. Members of the public, uh, members of the public will be given two minutes to speak and I would remind you to uh, not begin until the Sergeant at Arms has started the clock. The next speaker on this item will be Harry Bubbins. Harry Bubbins.
starting time. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, Harry. Great, thank you. And uh, thank you to our local council member Rivera for continuing to listen to the community and the community board resolution in opposition to this project, especially. Uh, Village Preservation is the largest membership organization in Greenwich Village, the East Village and NoHo. We strongly oppose the air rights transfer for the landmark for St. Mark's Place to an office tower at three St. Mark's Place. The potential benefit to the landmark house in the neighborhood is simply not worth the trade-off. Much of the restoration of four St. Mark's Place has already been executed. The applicant is simply seeking to get after the fact credit and financial benefit for this work and extra square footage for an office tower for additional work that is not needed and doesn't justify this transfer. We have serious concerns about the planned office tower at three St. Mark's Place, the gateway to the East Village. We believe an even larger office tower at this prominent location would have a negative impact upon the character of the neighborhood. Part of the beauty and significance of Four St. Mark's Place, which our organization successfully proposed for landmark designation in 2002, are the changes that's undergone over time. To simply erase those to gain approval for the air rights transfer is unnecessary and wrong. We are huge supporters of historic preservation. The nearby Merchant's House Museum is a perfectly preserved slice of New York from 200 years ago. That is not what this house, which isn't even open to the public, should be or needs to be. Erasing all that history to create a facsimile of what the building looked like two centuries ago is neither desirable nor justifies the air rights transfer. The real purpose of the application is to simply increase the size of the office tower. The special, purpose is, the special permit is not necessary to fund needed or even desirable work. The neighborhood is undergoing significant detrimental changes as the city seeks to extend Midtown South and Silicon Alley to the area. We continue to demand landmark and zoning protections here to prevent that from happening. Allowing this tech office tower to increase in size by 20% would only make that situation worse. We thus urgently urge you to reject the application before you today. Thank you. Thank you, Harry, for your testimony. Uh, council, do we have any council members uh, who may have questions uh, for this witness? Arthur, you, we got to unmute you. Sorry. That's okay. Jeremiah, uh, at this time, I see no members with questions. Great. Uh, there being no uh, further council members with questions, uh, the witness is now excused. Thank you. The next speaker will be Catherine Schoonover. Catherine Schoonover. Starting time. Catherine? Catherine, you can unmute yourself and you may begin when you're ready. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. My name is Catherine Schoonover, and I'm here to testify in opposition to the proposed air rights transfer from Four St. Mark's Place to a new, completely out of place office building being built at Three St. Mark's Place. I'm a lifelong villager and grew up on Stuyvesant Street around the corner from the site at issue. I know the area well. It is known the world over as the center of the East Village and its famous counterculture. The proposed office building is totally inappropriate for the site, excuse me, um, and allowing the building to be 20% larger than it could otherwise be by means of an air rights transfer would only make it that much more intrusive on the character of the neighborhood and its value as a tourist destination. Furthermore, the notion that the air rights transfer is justified because it will benefit a designated landmark is laughable, since only 5% of the proceeds of the transfer are even designated to be used to maintain the historic building across the street at Fort St. Mark's Place. The rest will simply go to enrich the developers who own the property. There will therefore be little to no public benefit from allowing this transaction to proceed whereas there will be clear harm to the neighborhood and ultimately to the city if it does proceed because the value of St. Mark's Place as a tourist destination will be diminished. Further, the life of the neighborhood will also be diminished because the office building will continue the alarming trend of homogenizing formerly distinctive areas of the city with fungible office developments everywhere. 
a larger office building will mean just that much more damage to St. Mark's Place. I strongly urge you to deny the application to transfer these air rights and to instead urge the Landmarks Preservation Commission to consider extending historic district protection in the area, consistent with its unique character and social and cultural history. Time expired. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Catherine. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, council, do we have any uh, council members that have any questions for this witness? Emily, I see no members with questions at this time. Great. Uh, there being no uh, further council members with questions, uh, the witness is now excused. The next witness will be John Center. John Center. And I will remind the public that once removed from the meeting, you will be able to view a live stream broadcast at the council's website using the link to virtual room three. Start in time. Chair Moya and council members, my name is John Center. I've lived on East. Uh, all right, let's start all over again, John. It's okay. No worries. If, if the sergeant at arms could just. I'm the sorry, sir. That's okay. Take your time. Whenever you're ready, John. Chair Moya and council members, my name is John Center. I've lived on East 9th Street for more than 25 years. I'm opposed to the transfer of air rights on St. Mark's Place from number four to number three. In short, Reek's proposal reeks. I urge you, the full committee on land use and the entire city council to deny this application. Concurrence Community Board three and other elected officials who have opposed it. Many neighbors share my view that it will be bad enough that the East Village gets yet another large commercial office building. Rampant out of place commercial development continues from Union Square South to Astor Place, while um, numerous nearby storefronts remain vacant. We need better zoning and landmark protections here, not an annex to the Death Star at 51 Astor Place. I was resigned to see a strictly commercial office building plan for three St. Mark's Place, but to add another 8,400 square feet to the project by transfer of air. Um, the bulk of any the benefits would go to the private developers, not to the public. We don't need to increase the FAR from 6.0 to 7.2. Developer says that with the air rights transfer, this new building would better fit in with other nearby buildings. But this is a flawed notion since several of those buildings are oversized from abuse of the community facilities bonus section of the zoning resolution. I appreciate the historic repairs and renovations that have been made at the Hamilton Holly House. However, the promise of continuing maintenance plan in exchange for a transfer of air rights is not enough. Please deny this application. I submitted longer written testimony and respectfully ask that you read and consider it before you vote. Thank you. My written testimony addresses some of the applicant's comments today in detail. Thank you, John. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Council, do we have any council members that uh, have, may have any questions for the witness? Chair Moya, there are no members with questions at this time. Okay. There being no further uh, council members uh, with questions, uh, the witness is now excused. Thank you, John. The next speaker will be Susie Schropp. Susie Schropp. Starting time. Hello, everybody. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear you, Susie? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I am the Tenants Association President at 8 St. Mark's Place, and I'm also a county committee member. I'm here to strongly um, oppose the air rights transfer from Free St. Mark's Place. Um, this is a very important project to the community. And I have to say, um, for somebody to come to this meeting unprepared, is kind of insulting considering how much time we have spent in looking into these things. I question why the only options are pretty with an extra 8,000 square foot or insanely ugly. Good designers can solve issues like that. And the advantages, quote unquote advantages that are presented to, to the community, we have never seen those proposals and we don't know what they are. And um, 
I don't understand how a developer could think that we, we are, you know, unpersuadable. So um, I want to say that um, the fact that there is no proposal on the table and the interaction with the community shows how genuinely intent this developer is on developing a relationship with the people here. They don't care. And COVID has demonstrated further infrastructure problems that we've already experienced on the block for decades. Um, the adding of retail in this particular location would only um, in, um, further um, increase an over congestion that we're already experiencing. Right now, for those of you who have been on the block, um, it's extremely congested. One part is the construction and the fact that it's a narrow street. Um, brick and mortar detail in the area is pretty dead. And adding more retail to the neighborhood- I'm expired. Only hurt um, uh, local businesses. I strongly in, in, um, encourage uh, you to vote against this application. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Council, do we have any council members that have any questions uh, for this witness? Chair Moya, no, me no members with questions at this time. Thank you. Uh, there being uh, no uh, further council members with questions, uh, the witness is now excused. Thank you so much for your testimony today. The next speaker will be Tom Burchard. Tom Burchard. Starting time. Tom, whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, say a few words about this project. Um, <clears throat> let me introduce myself. I'm Tom Burchard. I own Veselka Restaurant on the corner of 2nd Avenue and 9th Street. Um, I've been there for a long time. I love the neighborhood. I consider myself um, a very fortunate East Villager. Um, I've always regarded this intersection as the entryway, the gateway, the uh, border, if you will, to the East Village. Um, and to me, it's particularly distressing now to have a large office building built on the corner where formerly there was a candy store, a pizza parlor, a dive bar, further down a bookstore. Um, listening to the developer make his presentation, I consider it highly, highly unlikely that any business like that will go into this new building. Um, again, when, I've, when I cross Third Avenue, I've, I, can, I feel like I'm entering my home neighborhood. I'm, leave, I'm, I'm going into a neighborhood that's characterized by small buildings, many shops, mom and pop shops, many, many uh, of whom are run by people I know. <clears throat> and to have that corner now occupied by a large office building is really emblematic of the extreme um, uh, development pressure our neighborhood is facing. And honestly, it's very uh, distressing. So I, I ask you to please not allow, to, not, a, not to approve this application, not to reward this developer with additional floor space. And I also urge the council to please um, institute increased zoning and uh, landmarking protections for our neighborhood, which is so severely- Time expired. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for your testimony. Um, council, do we have any council members that have any questions for this witness? Oh, yeah, there are no members with questions. Uh, there being no further uh, council members uh, with questions, uh, the witness is now excused. The next speaker will be Catherine Wolf. Catherine Wolf. Starting time. Catherine? Yes. 
Whenever you're ready, you may begin. I'm ready. You can begin. Okay. My, my name is Catherine B. Walpe. I live at 107 East 10th Street in the St. Mark's Historic District. And I'm a parishioner at St. Mark's Church in the Bowery, located at the corner of East 10th Street and 2nd Avenue. Living in a historic district for more than 40 years has helped me appreciate the benefits of such designations in preserving our city's neighborhoods and flavors. The East Village is a unique neighborhood re reflecting the diverse immigration from many countries to a neighborhood where people live together in peace. The construction site at 3 St. Mark's Place is across from the Cooper Union's historic main building where, hi, do I need to click something? No, you're fine, Catherine. Okay. Keep going. The, historic, the construction site at St. Mark's, three St. Mark's Place is across from the Cooper Union's historic main building where President Abraham Lincoln gave a famous address in the 1800s. Granting air rights for this construction will impact this building and the Astor Place area, which is also already overcrowded. A large building will place additional burdens on subway and bus service, not to mention to pedestrians on already overcrowded nearby sidewalks and traffic. We already have NYU and Cooper Union dormitories and classrooms within a few blocks of this neighborhood. Other infrastructure affected would be water supply and electrical service. I strongly urge you not to order, not to allow this air rights transfer to take place at 3 St. Mark's Place. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your testimony. Uh, council, do we have any council members uh, that have any questions for uh, this witness? Ramoya, no council members with questions for this witness. Uh, there being no further uh, council members uh, that have questions for the witness, uh, you are now excused. The next speaker will be Mary Fran Loftus. Mary Fran Loftus. Lord in time. Hello? Yep. Oh, okay. My yeah. name is Mary Fran Loftus. I have lived at Third Avenue and Ninth Street for over 25 years against the proposed air rights transfer from the landmark St. Mark's Place to a new commercial office building at 3 St. Mark's Place, as this does not serve the public interest. An oversized office tower does not belong on St. Mark's Place. In this time of the COVID-19 pandemic, when many of our neighbors struggle to pay their rent, every block is strewn with four lease signs on storefronts and offices require their staff to work remotely. It is unconscionable to impose a strictly commercial building on this unique and mainly residential neighborhood. This corner is considered the gateway known for its rich cultural history in art and music. As Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer said in her decision, quote, the building's stated use and design is devoid of any acknowledgement fact, end quote. The meager 5% of the sale of the air rights that would go towards maintenance of the Hamilton Holly House show that this proposed transfer offers relatively little benefit to the public and little true pres preservation purpose. To my eyes, the only purpose of the planned transfer is greed, thereby lining the pockets of the developers. The additional square footage requested in this proposal is equivalent to 11 one-bedroom apartments, which would better serve our community. Rather than transfer air rights, we need improved zoning and landmark protections in this area. I fervently urge the committee to protect the people you have been elected to serve and whose taxes pay your salaries. Join the unanimous decision by Community Board 3 and Borough President Gail Brewer. Deny this proposal. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, it, council, do we have any council members uh, that have any questions for this witness? Chair Maya, I see no members with questions for the witness. Uh, there being no further council members with questions, uh, the witness is now excused. 
The next speaker will be Kathleen Wakeham. Kathleen, Kathleen Wakeham. Starting time. Kathleen? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Kathleen. Yes. Um, yeah. So, Kathleen, wait before you start. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you My name is Kathleen Wakeham of the Metropolitan Council on Housing. I am a rent stabilized tenant who has lived in the East Village since 1973. Because I am aware of the needs and character of our community, I ask, please do not approve air rights or any other concessions for the proposed high rise at 3 St. Mark's Place. As we know, over 24,000 New Yorkers have died from COVID-19. Over a million have lost jobs and another million are facing eviction because of inability to pay rent. In these times, our community does not need another high rise tower. This proposed tower will not provide employment because many are working from home if they are not already unemployed. The changing face of the world of work demonstrates that high rise office space is something of the past, not the future. It will not provide needed affordable housing. Rather, it will only increase the vacancy rate to over 5% because very few, if any, can afford rent in a high rise tower. The benchmark of 5% by the housing vacancy survey may end rent stabilization. The survey is to be issued next year pending legislation in Albany. Also, this construction will drastically impact our neighborhood. It will be an erection of the Grim Reefer, Reefer over the demise of the East Village. Please do not approve air rights or any other concessions for the propo proposed high rise tower at 3 St. Mark's Place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen, for your testimony. Uh, council, do we have any council members that have uh, any questions for this witness? Ramoya, no council members with questions at this time. Okay, so there being no uh, further council members with questions, uh, the witness is now excused. Thank you so much, Kathleen. The next speaker will be Laura Sewell. Laura Sewell. Starting time. Laura? I am joining. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm Laura Sewell. Oops. I'm trying to start my video. Here we go. Okay. I'm Laura Sewell, okay. the director of the East Village Community Coalition and a longtime East Village resident. The developers have heard over and over again from our community regarding the use of an air rice transfer for this particular project. Community board hearings on the subject, both landmarks and land use hearing committees, exceeded capacity. They were packed. People waited hours for the chance to say the same thing. Our community simply doesn't find enough public benefit on offer. CB3 agreed. Limited additional work and a maintenance plan for the recently restored Hamilton Holly House does not offset the impact of adding an oversized commercial property here at the expense of a neighborhood already experiencing extreme development pressure. The response from the developers to any real community concessions was that it was not an option. We had an attitude of, you don't seem to understand we're gonna build anyway, we could have made it all glass or we'll make it prettier if we can make it bigger. That was the response. And, and I agree with the people who've said today that that is extremely disappointing for such an important corner to our neighborhood. It's a, it's a, it is the gateway, it is a plaza um, that is the path to the East Village from the west side and any development here should reflect the character 
of the Lower East Side East Village Historic District. And thank you very much for your time and for the opportunity to speak. Thank you uh, for your testimony. Council, do we have any council members uh, that have any questions uh, for this witness? Oh, yeah, no council members with questions for this witness. Um, okay, there being no further uh, council members with questions, uh, this witness is now excused. The next speaker will be Trevor Stewart. Trevor Stewart. Starting time. Uh, Chair Moya, uh, subcommittee members, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak in opposition to uh, the proposed air rights transfer, and I believe in support of Councilwoman Rivera's opposition. Uh, my name is Trevor Stewart, and I've lived in the village for over half my life. Uh, the office tower plan for Three St. Mark's Place is completely inappropriate for this neighborhood. More office space and retail space, unfortunately, crying out for a bank, a drugstore, or a Starbucks, not what we need. Unfortunately, this is part of the city's misconceived plan to transform the neighborhood into an extension of Silicon Alley and Midtown South by demolishing uh, low-rise historic residential buildings and replacing them with high-rise office towers. The approval of the 14th Street Tech Hub last year is accelerating this disturbing trend. Unfortunately, the damage to 3 St. Mark's Place is now done, it's history, order under the bridge. The matter before you today is whether to add insult to injury to make this inappropriate development of Three St. Mark's 20% larger by approving the transfer of air rights from the landmark Hamilton Holly House across the street. The proposed air rights transfer would harm the character of the East Village, as you've heard from others, and is not in the public interest. The 5% of the proceeds that would go towards maintenance of Hamilton Holly is hardly needed. The house is in good condition and doesn't need an air rights transfer to fund its maintenance. There's little benefit for the public and little true preservation purpose. Instead, the purpose of the plan transfer seems largely to be to enrich two developers. Instead of increasing the size of this out of character development, the city should instead extend real landmark and zoning protections to this area. Unfortunately, it has consistently refused to do so. I strongly urge you to not approve this air rights transfer. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you uh, for your testimony. Uh, council, do we have any council members that have any questions for this witness? Chair Moya, no members with questions for this witness. Uh, there being no further uh, council members uh, with questions, uh, the witness is now excused. Thank you so much for your testimony today. The next speaker will be Anita Isola. Anita Isola. Starting time. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened here. But anyhow, uh, I live at the, I live on East 10th Street between Broadway and 4th Avenue. I have lived in the village for my whole 70 years. And I have watched the changes that have been coming about. The most drastic is what I'm seeing now in this East Village area, this south of Union Square that has been targeted by the city as uh, the new Silicon Alley or Midtown South. There is, a, this building is totally out of character. It, it, it totally mars the gateway to the East Village. There is no public benefit because the meager 5% of the proceeds is not needed to maintain this building. Um, the argument that was made about these local businesses that will be moving in is also ludicrous. No local, little local businesses typical of the East Village will be moving in there. There will be bank, a bank, and there will be a drugstore, and maybe if you're lucky, there will be another nail salon. Uh, I, am, I am very deeply opposed to this transfer. What we need, what we need in this area is 
a rezoning and landmarking protection that will prevent any further marring of this area. Uh, thank you for your attention. I very strongly, I very strongly urge that you deny this request. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, council, do we have any council members uh, who have any questions for this witness? MYI, I see no members with questions for this witness. Thank you. There being uh, no further council members with questions, the witness uh, is now excused. If there are any other members of the public who wish to testify on LU number 680 for the three St. Mark's Place proposal, please press the raise hand button now. The meeting will now stand at ease while we check for members of the public. Pardon me, Chair Moet, there are uh, no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Thank you. Um, there being no other members of the public who wish to testify for the public hearing on LU uh, 680 for uh, 3 St. Mark's Place, uh, the hearing is now closed. Uh, that concludes today's business. Uh, today's applications are laid over. Uh, I remind you that if you have uh, written testimony on these items, you may submit it to uh, land use testimony at council.nyc.gov uh, and please indicate the LU number and or the project name in the subject heading. Uh, I would like uh, to thank the applicants, members of the public, my colleagues, the subcommittee council uh, and the land use uh, and council staff, the sergeant Chair at arms. Yep. Chair Moya, so, sorry, just before you adjourn. Yes. We'll come back for the vote. Oh, my apologies. Uh, on the subcommittee vote, by a vote of five in the affirmative, one in the negative, and no abstentions, the item is uh, approved and referred to the full land use committee. Thank you. And now that concludes today's uh, business. Uh, today's applications are laid over. I remind you that if you have written testimony on these items, you may please submit them to the Land Use Testimony Council at uh, Land Use Testimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, please indicate the LU number and or project name in the subject heading. And of course, I would like to thank again the applicants, members of the public, my colleagues, the subcommittee council, land use, and other council staff, and the sergeant at arms for participating in today's hearing. Uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you.